Hello, good evening. A few housekeeping things before we start. You have all joined in in listen-only mode. However, there will be opportunities uh, for you to ask questions during the talks and towards the end. I'll explain a bit more when I introduce the program. A recording of the event will be made available on the Birmingham ESSC Festival Social Science website shortly after the event. My name is Zhu Hua from the Mosaic Group for Research in Multilingualism School of Education, University of Birmingham. On behalf of the Mosaic Group and my colleagues, Dr. Elizabeth Chilton, Dr. Eleni Morel, and Dr. Benny Bassetti, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. The event aims to explore three interrelated questions. How can parents support bilingual and multilingual children to develop their language skills during COVID-19? How do families adjust their family language learning practice to sustain or expand learning opportunities? And what resources and options are available at home and in the communities? We have fantastic lineup speakers for today. Each speaker will speak for five minutes and they will share their experience and views on how to support the multilingual children. For this part of the mini talks, you can submit questions using the Q&A function. And if selected, this will be read out by the chair. And we're planning to answer one quick specific question for each talk. Following the mini talks, we have a few minutes for open dis discussion. You're most welcome to use Q&A function to ask questions. And we're delighted to have Professor Marilyn Martin-Jones, our Emeritus Professor and Founding Director of the Mosaic Center with us today. And she will offer a quick summary and close event at the end. So without further ado, can I invite our the chair for the first session, Dr. Eleni Morel, to introduce the speaker. Hello, everyone. Welcome from me. Um, the first speaker is Dr. Fatima Said. Dr. Fatima Said is an assistant professor in applied linguistics at Zayed University in the UAE. She has previously held posts at the University of York and Goldsmiths University of London and her research focuses on the bilingualism of Arabic English speaking children and their families. Fatima, you may start. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for being here with us today. Um, and uh, so I'll start my talk. The question I'm focusing on is um, to do with how multi, how bilingual and multilingual um, families adjust their language practices or their policies during um, uh, the COVID lockdown. So as we know, um, the COVID lockdown obviously has brought so much stress, uh, forced changes, you know, things like distance learning, um, lockdown and um, these kinds of things. So parents have to find ways to adjust their practices and their policies or their rules um, about languages in order to support their children. Um, one of the main things that I've uh, seen in the research I'm currently conducting on family language policy is that uh, technology seems to be one way that many parents are going. So traditionally, when parents want their children to learn a heritage language, um, in my research, I look at parents who want their children to learn Arabic, they would normally send them to teachers um, either in weekend schools or they would hire a teacher to come home and teach them or send them to a kind of a community centre. But obviously um, COVID-19 has meant that um, uh, there's no close contact and so parents have to explore different kinds of things. Um, and one of the things I've kind of coined or one of the things I've kind of come up with is looking at technology as a supporter for parental practice or parental um, uh, um, ideology or what they want their children to uh, achieve during the lockdown. Um, and I've put some pictures up and you can see uh, a picture of food and this is to do with vlogs. Vlogs are really big in the families I'm studying. Um, they watch uh, recipes together in Arabic. 
Um, parents have the opportunity to, to then expand their children's vocabulary. Uh, you know, well, how do you say meat? How do you say onions in Arabic? Then obviously there's the basic alphabets or the grammatical or the linguistic based resources as well that they find on YouTube and other kinds of websites. Um, and then the third kind of um, resource that uh, parents are using technologically is short stories because obviously this expands literacy and then vocabulary and uh, there are all kinds of resources online. Many of these are free. Um, some of them come in PDF so the parents can flick the pages with their children and they can read these um, with them every day. The families I'm studying um, seem to uh, enjoy reading books either at bedtime or during the day but they have set times to um, do these kinds of things. So technology um, uh, has also you know entered the house in such a way that parents who are really um, worried or concerned about how much their children are consuming technology now have become less critical um, and the creative parents are finding ways to support their children to um, access uh, the internet to help them expand and uh, increase their knowledge in the heritage language. As we all know, languages like Arabic and Chinese and these languages don't have outside support. So it usually comes down to the parents to come up with ways of supporting uh, their children, either through, either through schooling or, in this case, um, technology. So I just wanted to, uh, I compiled a list of six tips, if you like, that I've uh, taken from the studies I'm doing right now, right now with parents and especially during the lockdown. And I've realized that um, the, first thing par the first thing parents should do is relax because obviously it's, <laughs> it's anxi anxiety inducing and it's stressful. Um, and there are so many things, you know, being in a closed space, being there together all the time. And then there are other parental duties like feeding and cooking for kids and clothing them and making sure they're actually doing their work in a distance mode. So the first thing to do really is, um, I think parents should try to relax as much as possible. Um, bonding with children is a is an important aspect. So I know most parents are doing this and some of the other research I'm doing on COVID-19 is that um, parents uh, get to see their children, how they work, and so they appreciate them more, their children appreciate them more. But bonding is one of the themes that runs throughout some of the uh, language policy or language learning uh, literature that says this is one of the successes or one of the reasons why children would learn uh, the parent's language. The other tip is to make time and space for the language. So once or twice a week, we'll sit down and read or we'll watch a YouTube video together. And space is really important um, because some of the research I'm doing now, I'm realizing that parents who make space, like a small library or a table where they do these activities, um, uh, psychologically prepares a child to say, I'm going to be doing, uh, I'm going to be learning Arabic or I'm going to be learning this language. The other thing is obviously do what suits you. It doesn't have to be academic. You don't have to find videos that um, are all you know, perfect with each other and so on, but do what suits you if it's a vlog because you get to expose the children to the language and so on. And then engage in small practices, but be consistent. And so this is the main, uh, these are the main six tips I would like to give you this evening in terms of how to support your children um, during the lockdown. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this um, short but highly informative talk, uh, Fatima. Um, I have one question uh, for you. We have very limited time. We have only one minute. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, how can we as parents make use of technology to support children's learning of the heritage language? Mm. Well, it depends. It depends on... Um how i don't want to say tech savvy or how familiar how familiar you are with technology but it helps to survey the youtube videos maybe you can pitch and see would these be suitable for my children because obviously older children would need more complex uh, resources younger children would need really basic ones and then you have to realize what do you want out of it do you want them to you know in, i'll give you an example like in arabic we have a diagnostic situation where we have the 
classic or the formal Arabic and then the spoken Arabic. So one of the many um, struggles parents have is which Arabic do I give my children? Do I give them the formal one or do I give them the spoken one? So I would say you need to make those kinds of decisions. Um, what type of Arabic do I, do I want to expose them to? If you want the set videos of the alphabets, then you'll be, you'll be giving them formal Arabic. If you want the vlogs, then you'd be giving them some type of social awareness of how different varieties of Arabic are used and how Arabic culture is enacted if you like so it really really depends but technology can become a supporter but that's not to say it's not a challenge that's not to say that there would be uh, friction or maybe the kids don't really want to do that um, so it just depends that's why I said do what suits you so it depends on your family and what would work for you I hope that answered the question <laughs> great thank you very much I think we have uh, about 20 seconds, just one more quick question. Sure, sure. How do you think technology as supporter would work with older children? Oh, okay, that's a nice question. Um, with older children, of course, it, it, it because it's a language content, it's going to depend on their proficiency of, of language. So one of the families I was studying was a single mother with uh, two sons, and she found that uh, by watching vlogs with her sons, she connected with them, but also gave them an opportunity to learn jokes in Arabic or how to prank people in Arabic or, you know, like, so she found that um, this supported her sons. And in the end, they were coming to her to say to her, should we watch a vlog or should we do something? So from it being a boring, laborious, oh my God, we have to learn Arabic. It kind of became a thing of, should we do this together? So, so that's why in, the lit in my work, I talk a lot about family as a system and then family bonding and how these are ingredients that can help. So. Great. Thank you ever so much. Thank Asma. you so much. Um, you. I will move on to our next chair, Elizabeth Chilton to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Eleni and Fatma, that was really great. Right, um, I'd like to introduce Sara Abdullahi. She is a research fellow and PhD student at University College London Institute of Education. She has undertaken research on family language policy with the Somali community in London. Her research is currently focused on how multi-generational families experience language shift and identity building through social networks. So over to you, Sara. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Elizabeth. Um, so yes, in addition to the research that I'm doing on language shift uh, in the Somali community, I was also part of a research project that looks into family language policy across three communities in the UK, the Chinese, the Polish and the Somali communities. Um, over the course of that two year project, I worked closely with many Somali families and conducted research where I would visit them on a weekly basis to observe the interactions in the home setting. Um, I also interviewed the parents and asked them what specific things they did and what choices they made in their homes in order to help their children uh, maintain their mother tongue. So uh, what I learned uh, was that there was a stark difference between families where the parents were deliberate in their family language policy uh, as compared with families where the parents had not developed any specific strategies to cope with changes uh, and especially with the fact that children were going to be much more exposed to the host uh, language uh, on a daily basis once they'd reached school age. Um, it's this competition between languages that often results in heritage language not becoming very developed um, and this is particularly true in cases where the mother tongue is a minority language that is not highly valued uh, in British society which is uh, the case with Somali. So um, to corroborate this last point uh, further, uh, research from Kurt Christensen and Nimodia, um, which looked at another set of three uh, ethnic communities in the UK, well, the Chinese, the Italian and the Urdu speaking Pakistani communities, um, found that although all three groups of parents uh, aspired to raise additive uh, bilingual children, um, their capacity to do so was significantly affected by the status and social function of their languages, um, with the Urdu speaking community being most disadvantaged. Um, so this was in part because the parents themselves regarded their heritage language as less important due to its low instrumental value in society and consequently um, they provided fewer literacy resources and practices for their children and I've seen a similar thing in the Somali community as well so um, 
in, to add to this, it's also true that the type of family can have a significant impact on the maintenance of the mother tongue. So, for example, three generation families with grandparents speaking the heritage language are more likely to help in the process of additive bilingualism than, say, for example, families with lots of siblings who all encourage one another to speak the host language at home. So in the latter example, uh, I've often observed that the capacity for children to speak the mother tongue decreases from the oldest to the youngest, um, where there are no interventions from parents to help the kids maintain their home language. Um, so to add to this, it's also well understood that parents have a lot of responsibilities and so it can be difficult sometimes to find stretches of time to dedicate uh, to specific practices to support children um, in their mother tongue development. So how then do we, uh, how do bilingual families uh, adjust their family language policies to sustain or expand their learning opportunities? And uh, if currently your family language policies are implicit rather than explicit, uh, then how do you go about including more specific strategies to help your children maintain their heritage language? Um, so I've come up with a few examples of things that I noticed in the Somali families that I observed um, uh, that they did in order to uh, maintain the heritage language despite all the obstacles of it being a sort of low value minority language. Um, not all of the families adopted these, but the ones that did were seemed more successful um, in maintaining the heritage language. So um, the first thing that they did was they told stories uh, at bedtime and in playtime, they would tell stories to the kids in Somali. And they also encouraged their children to interact with family members who didn't speak English uh, and or who only spoke Somali. Um, and this was done through uh, sometimes uh, grandparents and also video calls and voice calls. Um, they would sing songs and teach the kids fun rhymes which helped with vocabulary. Um, they played naming games and I spy games in Somali, which also helped in vocab. Um, they insisted on kids speaking, but uh, they insisted on themselves speaking in Somali to the kids, even if the kids would reply back in English. And finally, where they could um, have access, they would find uh, videos and uh, TV shows in Somali um, and help the kids in that way, and also through literacy, if that was possible. So despite the fact that the languages uh, were not, um, well, Somali and Odi are not necessarily highly regarded languages, and there are others. Um, there are still uh, resources available. There are still ways to uh, to maintain the heritage language uh, if you create a sort of framework that centers a fun approach to learning uh, in the home. So that's it from me. And thank you for listening. And if you do have any questions, then please do uh, pass them on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Let me just have a look and see what questions we've got for you. So um, I've got a really good question here for you. How can we find resources to help maintain children's mother tongue at home? Thank you. So um, it is uh, it is more difficult with low status languages to find lots of resources, um, but I would definitely uh, echo what Fatima said um, in looking online uh, for for uh, different options on YouTube. I know that there's lots of uh, people who are making YouTube videos in Somali and uh, lots of children friendly uh, videos where they're actually uh, teaching children vocabulary and things like that. Um, there's also lots of uh, organizations, community organizations that create uh, bilingual books uh, which are available online. Um, and there's lots of uh, bilingual books available from Amazon as well. You know, there's a company called My First Bilingual Book, which uh, specializes in creating bilingual books for uh, low status minority languages. And I've seen lots of um, interesting ones in Somali there as well. So there are different resources. It just takes a little bit more creativity uh, if, if it's a low status language to just sort of really um, go out there and have a look and see what you can find. Great timing, perfect timing, sorry. That's a minute answer. Great. Okay. Um, thank you so much. And I'd like to pass over now to Professor Zhu Hua. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so next speaker is Dr. Lavania Sankara. She is a lecturer in language education at King's College London. Her research interest lies in the intersection of society and language. She recently completed a three-year Liverpool funded project that examined 
multilingual development among Sri Lanka Tamils in London. And that's the topic she's going to speak to tonight. Thank you very much uh, for that. My topic for this evening is redefining the mother tongue and will be informed by some important insights I've gained from the Sri Lankan Tamil project. Being a part of the Tamil community in London, I've long been aware of the anxiety around mother tongue maintenance, whether children are learning their mother tongue, or whether they are able to communicate effectively with it. There is a worry that if the younger generation are not able to speak the Tamil language like their parents and grandparents, it means that they are in danger of losing their Tamil identity. Much sociolinguistic research has looked into the language shift that takes place as a result of migration, where typically a shift to the dominant language spoken in the host community takes place over time. So you may have parents migrating as monolingual mother tongue users, but their children and grandchildren might be seen as more proficient speakers of the dominant language used in their host countries. However, on closer examination, the picture is often more complicated where children are using their mother tongue in many contexts and often with other languages. Scholars in the field suggest that families should perhaps orient to their mother tongue differently and consider diverse non-traditional verbal resources and other communicative strategies as indexing the mother tongue and identity. A well-established linguistic anthropological concept called communicative repertoires can help explain this. It shifts attention away from the idea of languages as being separate, marking the ethnic, cultural or national identities of particular groups of people. It recommends instead that we view language as part of a repertoire consisting of a variety of linguistic resources for communicative and identity work. Resources can vary from expert competence in a wide range of genres, registers and styles in a named language to specific bits and pieces of language. One's communicative repertoire also includes other means of communication, such as gesture, dress, posture, familiarity with types of food and drink, and mass media references. The communicative repertoire concept has proven useful in interpreting my own data. I interviewed 42 Sri Lankan Tamils living in London, where around a third of them made up the second generation shown in the table. They reported that they use the Tamil language in all sorts of interactional contexts that occur within the home and the neighborhood. But it's important to note that in all these contexts, they often use Tamil together with other language resources, such as English or a European language. In the table, you can see the range of linguistic repertoires my participants possess and how they use them in different contexts. The cells shaded in blue show the second generation's use of Tamil, from when only Tamil is used, dark blue, mostly Tamil is used, medium blue, when Tamil is used equally with other language resources, turquoise, or when only a little Tamil is used, light blue. The cells shaded in yellow show the use of a European language resource like French, or German to represent the linguistic repertoires of Tamils who recently migrated from the EU. Please note, however, that even here, you can see that often Tamil co-occurs with a European language use. This is illustrated in the following example. The participant Ayapa is a second generation Tamil who moved from Berlin to the UK as a child. In the interview, he spoke about how he tends to mix Tamil, English and German when interacting with his family. In conclusion, I would like to stress that communication is complex, especially in our era of heightened transnational movement and the internet. So to understand how we communicate, it's helpful to think of languages not as compartmentalized categories, but as mobile resources, which are always in contact, mutually shaping one another in everyday interaction. 
we should try to move away from the idea that to speak in two or three languages, we need to speak them all perfectly and separately. Perhaps the way to maintain and foster one's mother tongue is to take a practice-based perspective and redefine the mother tongue such that it accommodates mixed language use. Thank you. I think you're still muted. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Lavanya. Uh, that's a really wonderful presentation. And that the idea of a communicative repertoire uh, is um, a such departure from the traditional view that the language as a discrete entities. And we do have a couple of questions actually from the question from, from, from the audience. I'm not going to ask all of them, but essentially these questions all about the competition between different languages. So one specific question is, should I correct my child if she mixes her mother tongue with English when speaking to us? I'm worried if she keeps doing this, she won't know how to speak her mother tongue properly. How do you would like to respond to that question? Yes, um, I'm happy to respond to that. I think um, just uh, looking back at what we've talked about, the communicative repertoire um, concept is very useful, and it 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 makes us it it encourages us to move away from this idea that languages should be used uh, separately and and should be used perfectly, should be produced in this way that we should think about them as, as having walls and compartmentalize them. Perhaps we should be encouraged to think about uh, using our language uh, in mixed ways because it, according to the question, it seems as if your child is using their mother tongue in a meaningful way, right? And, and if we try to correct them, maybe we would um, uh, maybe force them to use them in ways that are not natural to them. And what we want is for them to feel comfortable using all the language resources uh, that, that they have to communicate effectively. I hope thank that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. So I will hand it over to Eleni for the next speaker. Thank you, Zuhua. Our next speaker um, is Amy Thompson. Amy Thompson is the founding manager of uh, Daling Montessori Bilingual Nursery, the first Mandarin English immersion bilingual Montessori nursery in the UK. She has also worked as a local authority education and school improvement advisor and she has extensive experience as a language teacher, both in mainstream and community language schools. Amy, over to you. You would need to unmute your mic, please. Amy, please Hello. unmute. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm um, here to tell you a little bit about um, my bilingual uh, nursery school. Um, so I guess I'm addressing the question of what resources are available in the community to support um, bilingual, de multilingual development. Um, so my, my uh, nursery school is a bilingual um, Mandarin English uh, immersion bilingual uh, school. So we're based on the North American bilingual immersion education model. Um, and the definition of immersion bilingual education is generally accepted as um, one where at least 50% of the teaching day um, during a, a given academic year um, must be provided through the second language. And in this case, the second language for us is Mandarin, um, because Mandarin is not the um, dominant or the major language in society in, in this country. So um, this uh, immersion uh, bilingual uh, education model um, principally started in, in North America in the 1960s. So it has a history of um, over 50, 60 years of implementation and research. So we feel that we are uh, building our nursery on quite solid um, foundation. Um, so for our nursery school, then we try to replicate as much as possible the conditions uh, for developing the first language, um, and, um, which means that um, uh, for both English and, and Mandarin, um, and that means that we have to pay attention to not just the language development, but also their 
cognitive, the children's cognitive development and social development, because um, that's what happens um, in first language development, or all, all these happen hand in hand at the same time. So how, um, how do we do it? So we follow the OPO model, OPOL, which is one person, one language model. So we have one Mandarin teacher and one English teacher. Uh, we also have a Mandarin speaking teaching assistant. So for the Mandarin speaking adults, they only speak uh, Mandarin to the children and the English speaking adults, they only speak English to the children. They, they never lapse into the other language, um, even though the children may speak um, another language to them. Um, uh, we also have clear separation of activities um, so that uh, we have circle time in Mandarin and we also have circle time in English. So one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So we have two circle times in a day. Uh, and then uh, the teachers will also organize small group activities um, and uh, work with the children in their uh, own language. Um, and so while one teacher is working with one group of children, the other teacher will work with the other children in their other language. So the activities are separate and the teachers um, uh, use their language with the children. Um, this is different from uh, some bilingual schools where I have um, experienced, where you may have one English um, nursery teacher working alongside uh, of maybe say a French teaching assistant, and they're doing the one activity at the same time. So the teaching assistant is working alongside the English um, nursery teacher, and they will speak th their own language with the children. What I find in such a situation is that the children will tend to, the English speaking children will tend to um, tune out of, of French. They, they actually, there's no need for them to pay attention to French at all because the English teacher is there speaking uh, English to them. So we find, feel that this is not so effective as, as an approach. So our activities are, are separated. Um, in terms of curriculum, then we uh, follow the um, early years foundation stage uh, framework, which is statutory, and we are inspected uh, by it as well. Uh, but um, we're also a Montessori inspired um, school, so we, uh, we incorporate uh, some of the Montessori uh, philosophy and um, practices uh, into our curriculum. Um, so, uh, so how do we actually develop, uh, deliver the curriculum then? So the, the teachers will decide, um, so we have a, a, an annual, a, a yearly plan. So we decided on the themes that we follow, but we've also then divided our, our learning targets into uh, term, half term targets. So the teacher have uh, the same, uh, will work according to the same themes. Um, so, for example, the theme for this, the themes for this term will be all about me and autumn. So, the English uh, teacher may look at, may approach all about me from uh, by organizing an activity. Say, for example, um, she'll get the children to look into a mirror, and they'll work with the children and talk to them about um, noticing their features. So, it's more like um, uh, an identity. Um, approach, looking at the, that um, identity. So um, looking into the mirror, talking to them about the features, uh, looking at similar differences with other people, um, they may then do a drawing. Whereas the uh, Mandarin teacher, oh my god, so uh, the Mandarin teacher, sorry, um, I won't be able to finish uh, my talk. Um, so my the Mandarin teacher will uh, look at um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, the family and talk about kinship terms and teach them um, kinship terms in Mandarin. Um, so ha that's that's how we deliver the curriculum. Um, so yeah, any questions? <laughs> I might be able to answer you. Sorry, I can't finish my last point. <laughs> I have to stop. Sorry, Amy. I'm sorry. Uh, but thank you very much. Um, yes, we have we have a couple of questions. So we have about a minute. So the first question is. Um, Okay, we've got quite a few. Um, do you think that using the two languages increases children's attainment across all the subjects taught? Oh, I can only speak from our research rather than from our own um, experience because we've only been in existence for um, a year or less than a year. Actually, we started last April, but we've had six months of lockdown. so. Um, we don't have any long-term data to show you, but all the research says that yes, there's um, definite uh, benefits, um, ac academic benefits for children um, when you develop both languages to a high enough level. Yes. Thank you. And one final one, because I think it's really important and a couple of 
people from our audience uh, have asked, are the children um, in your school just Mandarin English speaking or do they speak any other languages? Do you have other backgrounds meaning? Um, yes, we do. Um, our, so our nursery school is not just for um, Chinese speaking background children. So we do have Chinese speaking background children, but we also have non-Chinese speaking background children. And we also have some mixed heritage um, uh, children as well. So yes. Interesting. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, and now Elizabeth Chilton will introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Elaine Mario. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Bemisola Isimi. She's founder of Culture Tree, a pan-African organization. She has a passion for preserving her West African heritage and believes children should be proud and excited about their culture. Culture Tree offers a range of Yoruba classes and creative activities to, to, to support parents to raise rooted children. So we're really looking forward to hearing about this, um, Bemisola. Thank you so Thank much you. Sister, for having me. It's been an amazing talk. I've learned so much from everybody already. So the question I'll be tackling is how can parents support bilingual or multilingual children to develop their language skills during COVID-19 pandemic? So as Elizabeth said, the language we currently teach at Culture Tree is Yoruba. Um, Yoruba is a language spoken in West Africa and most prominently Southwestern Nigeria. It's spoken by over 50 million people across the world in the UK, United States, South America, and many more. But the challenge we face with migration, it um, came negligence from the original speakers of Yoruba language in the diaspora to pass the language onto their children. These second generation children have now grown into adults and parents who do not speak the language or at least speak it well enough to teach their children. They would like to, and this is where we come in, this is where Culture Tree comes in. So most African parents in diaspora are raising their children in a community where English is a majority language and language teachers like myself can only do so much in their scheduled class and with homework. The bulk of the work actually falls on parents to create an immersion environment. But how can you do this if you don't speak the language yourself and you don't live in an environment where it's spoken? How can parents support bilingual children to develop their language skills? Well, we strongly advocate for all the speakers of the language to take part in the education of bilingual children. We call these older speakers the family language custodians. We believe that every bilingual family ought to have a language custodian. These family language custodians could be grandparents, an older family member or a friend who is fluent in the language. They can step in and support parents, especially now during COVID-19 pandemic. Children need to have a lot of exposure to the sounds, words and grammars of the language that they're learning. The family's chosen language custodian can help with this. Parents can set regular time aside via Zoom, Skype, or telephone calls for their children to hear and speak to this person in the language. These sessions can incorporate stories, riddles, and songs from the language custodian. The sessions will provide input and ongoing interaction in the language, which is necessary in fostering functional bilingualism during COVID-19 and beyond. So basically to conclude, what we advise is that we need, there needs to be a language custodian in the family who is responsible for making sure that even though the parents themselves are not fluent or don't speak it themselves, they have somebody who's available to them to help them and support them pass on the language. Thank you. That was great. All my speakers are really quick and they just keep to that time. They're very, very good. Not that, not that other speakers aren't good as well, I think well. <laughs> really good. Anyway, let me have a look at the questions. What I've got is, um, right, I regret not teaching my teenager my mother tongue from when he was young, and now he has no interest in learning. How can I get him interested? So how would you like, to, how would you answer that? Um, I think Fatima said something quite interesting. She mentioned an older speaker who wasn't able to kind of connect with that child. And she mentioned the parent having a, you know, I, I love the idea of vlogs. It's technology is, is um, an enabler now. And having a child who's an older child obviously doesn't have time, doesn't have no interest in speaking or sitting down there. So I think the best thing to do is find an, uh, an interest point. So vlogs, for example, kids love, you know, older children love watching vlogs. 
find an interest point. It could be something that the child likes doing and find that point. But the most important thing as, and I think, um, uh, I think it was um, the tips. Yeah, it was, it was Fatima again who mentioned about the tips. Relax. <laughs> I think we need to just relax and just remember that this is, this is a two-way thing. Um, and if we are stressed about it, the child is also stressed about it as well. And I think the most important thing that you're planting a seed in that, in that child um, and find an interest point, something that the child enjoys doing. It could be singing, it could be maybe storytelling, it could be writing songs, it could be um, writing a script. But find that interest point and hone hone in on that is what I would say. That's great. Thank you so much for that advice. That's brilliant. Um, thank you. I'm going to pass us back now to um, Zuhua, who's going to be chairing the open discussion. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to the speakers and to the chairs. You've done a fantastic job um, in setting the, the, the scene and also um, keeping the time. Okay, so we have um, nine minutes for open discussion. Um, so can I ask um, audience to put your question in Q&A and not in chat at this particular stage because it's easier for us to actually to monitor Q&A rather than having two screens open at the same time. So um, if you have any questions or you want to share your experience, please put in the Q and A. Uh, meanwhile, I will be while you are preparing for the questions, thinking about questions you want to ask. I'm just actually looking through at um, back the questions and see whether there are anything that actually need to bring back. Okay, there is actually one uh, questions during the talk, um, and I saw that actually very relevant. Uh, maybe useful. We could actually start with that question. So this is a question actually um, triggered by Lavania's um, discussion on communicative repertoires. Um, the question is, how can we create awareness for the notion of a communicative repertoires among speakers themselves, not only among scholars of heritage languages? So this is actually, how do we bridge the theory and practice? Um, Lavania, are you happy to take this on first? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think uh, not enough is being said in the communities about how we speak. There needs to be an understanding of how we communicate uh, in the first instance. And one thing we can do is to bring uh, people's attention to the fact that, you know, when we, when especially during COVID, we've been relying a lot on technology, haven't we? And trying to use our various resources um, online, offline, doing those things, we are using the various uh, resources at our, our fingertips to communicate uh, effectively. And in order to communicate effectively, I think it's important to make speakers aware of the fact that uh, we have to now, uh, in our modern world where there's so much um, transnational movement, there's the internet, we have to try to use these resources available to us, verbal as well as nonverbal, to communicate well. And I think that's something we can use as example to show that this is important. We can't just try to, to view language, for instance, um, in these particular compartmentalized ways and, and make sure that communication is fluid and we use everything that we have that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a, a, one question from um, audience. Um, it's really about uh, the um, your views as a specialist, um, all the speakers, if you want to answer this question is um, according to research on language development, bilingual children achieve their, the milestone in language at the same time as children that only speak one language. There doesn't seem to be any downside to learning more than one language. However, this doesn't seem to be the case for our child who's trilingual. What are your views on this? Anyone want to? response to that one? Um, I, I suppose it, it depends on ex the amount of exposure of the languages. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, for example, in our own nursery school, it, 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 some children come every day, some children come two days, some children come three days, some are from Chinese speaking background, some not. So, you know, I, I would say the outcomes would be different for them, de you know, depending on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the research literature, just uh, 
getting back to um, this question is actually, it's not all the research literature. Um, yes, there are lots of things talking about success and the effort will pay off once it um, perseveres. But I think there are lots of literature actually out there saying there are also challenges. It's not a plain saving um, journey. And it actually involves all the efforts from various parts. And I think the, I love the idea, uh, Gemi Sola, you talk about custodia, language custodia. And that's how we, what we can do really to support, to make it easier for multilingual ch child at this stage to learn and to have um, exposure. Exposure is really important. Uh, so what we're doing is really trying to mitigate some possible factors that might actually influence the development and in all the cases that actually people making effort um, um, and then we see a great deal of success and joy at the end of journey is certainly not, uh, from, I'm speaking as well from my own experience about bring up two bilingual, uh, trilingual children uh, and, and how, they, we, how much uh, we have actually enjoyed the process, but there are also stories that actually um, that doesn't work well on the day so it's not always plain sailing. That's my experience. I don't know any other speakers want to share your views. Yeah, I, I would definitely add that there are um, oftentimes other factors um, that might impede the child when it comes to being able to produce language um, uh, or hit, hit the milestones as it were. I've, I've seen a lot of families um, in the Somali community have this issue of um, children having a delay in speech. And oftentimes uh, parents have expressed sort of uh, that fear that maybe they're being overwhelmed because there's so much confusion, but actually uh, when looking further into it, it's uh, often been the case that that child hasn't had a lot of, uh, like the other speakers have said, uh, exposure to either language because there aren't many people spending a lot of time speaking to them, reading to them, telling stories. And so it's taking a little bit longer for them to get what they can. Um, and so it's just really important to, um, to see what other, uh, what other issues might, might be um, impeding the child and, and definitely try to give them as much time as possible, uh, speaking to them as much as, as you can. Thank you, Sarah. Um, there are a couple of questions, of uh, really great questions, and uh, we won't have time to all of them. So I'm just actually, so please uh, forgive me if I um, didn't have a chance to pick your questions. So next question is actually uh, from Cassia. Um, but the question is, I would like to hear the speaker's views of whether they feel face-to-face -face meetings or language immersion visit are crucial. Can we give enough language exposure just via screens and or all a single heritage language parent. Can I can I answer this one? Sure. Yeah. Is it? Um, that's a really nice question, um, and that's something I've been thinking about um, during this research that I'm doing. That happened to fall <laughs> within COVID nineteen, and then all these issues of technology came up. Mm. Um, I don't think there's one perfect solution or one perfect way of doing everything. So I think there has to be a mixture of technology and face-to-face -face and immersion and language custodians and extended family and a community. And so there's so many things that can be put together that could, um, sup I suppose, to contribute to effective um, language learning. Um, but the other thing that we have to also remember in all of this is um, parental language belief or what parents think of the language uh, is really important. And that according to my research, um, seems to override even all the practice. So even if the children are exposed or they have classes and the parents are making the effort to give them Arabic or any of the other languages, if the parents don't themselves fully believe that this language is important, uh, the children won't learn. It won't be effective. So the parents have to have, I think what um, Kurt Christiansen uh, refers to as congruence between what they believe and what they actually practice. Because so many parents in my research, the Arabic is very important. But when we go to record um, how they use language in their homes, uh, Arabic is hardly used. So then the kids 
don't have the Arabic and the parents get frustrated because they feel like they're working really hard and so on. So I don't think that there's one ingredient or one specific way, but I think a mixture of different approaches could support the child. Well, thank you, Fatima. Um, I think I want to actually bring the last question, um, and it's actually from um, uh, audiences actually um, who actually work in schools. It's really about how do parents and teachers can work together. So I combine these questions, uh, two questions together, if I'm okay. So do you have a do our speakers have any suggestions for teachers who are asked to support bilingual learners um, through online lessons? And at the same time, parents also rely on teachers to help them with the idea of supporting languages at home. So do you have any suggestions? Um, there's also a specific question about uh, running language school. I don't think we have time for it. So maybe we could just focus on how can we, act, do you have any suggestions for teachers um, and how do we actually work together with parents? Um, I, I, can I can I answer? Sure. Yeah. Give me some. I, mean, I, I mentioned this, and, and I think there's only so much teachers can do in the lesson and, and and for homework. But in in our classes, what we do is we actually record the classes, so it's not just in that session that the kids are watching us learning. So we record it, and they can actually go after the lesson to go and um, to to watch the videos and pick up um, what they've learned. We, we create content as well on our YouTube. I know you, this comes up quite a lot, but YouTube is, has been so great with language learning and we create videos um, for our students. So we do, we do short videos, but we do classes, we teach them words, phrases. So I think there's a lot we can do with technology and most of it is just having that extra kind of help for parents and, it, and just creating short videos um, if, you're, if you're that way inclined. Um, and also homework. So exercise that they can do, you know, something as simple as, um, write a sentence about something you've done this week you, um, could really help. So I think it's just about creating those exercises and those means to make sure continue the, the, the learning outside of the class, the online class is what I would say. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's all the time we have for open discussion. Um, I'm handing over, uh, thank you um, uh, the, uh, for asking wonderful questions and thank you to our speakers to respond to these questions. So I'm handing over to Professor Marilyn Martin-Jones. Uh, as I introduced at the beginning, she's our uh, founder of Mosaic Group for Researching Multilingualism. So I'm handing over to you, Marilyn. Thank you so much, uh, Zuhua. And uh, like Zuhua, I'd like to uh, offer my sincerest thanks for these five really interesting contributions to the webinar. And thanks too for the, the great questions that have been coming through. Um, uh, it's been a very, very interesting session. Um, and we know that people have joined us from across the UK, but also from uh, beyond the UK as well, which is really exciting. Um, the five contributions provide us with a really timely reminder that many families in different communities in the UK live their lives multilingually and that being able to draw on diverse linguistic resources is vital at a time like now when the power to communicate is all important. Um, uh, as you probably know, COVID related communication is not, not just happening in English, it's happening in lots of other languages, including Arabic, uh, Chinese, uh, Tamil, Urdu, Welsh, and so on. Um, and also the contributions remind us of the significance of understanding language as communication, um, as we heard from um, different speakers. Um, understanding language instead as a social practice, uh, uh, like um, talking about it as, as a verb, as languaging, and, and often also um, blending different meaning-making resources from different named languages in day-to-day -day conversation. This is actually a practice that's often frowned upon in educational circles, but actually involves considerable creativity and has a lot of cultural significance. But, and last but not least, uh, the contributions remind us of the value of research collaboration between family members, community language teachers, um, state school teachers, and also researchers in building greater knowledge about the specific and local ways in which language resources are bound up with the different identities that we take on in our lives on and offline, um, as Zara pointed out first. 
And all three of these principles that I've mentioned um, guide the research that we do here in the Mosaic Group in the School of Education at the University of Birmingham. Uh, so um, it was great to hear these other voices saying the sorts of things that we're always passionate about here. And thank you particularly to, to um, Zuha for all the work that you've done in facilitating this dialogue. I do hope um, that it'll be possible to take the dialogue further uh, um, over the months and years ahead. Uh, let's try and make that happen. Thank you very much uh, all. So that's, that's it for uh, today's uh, webinar. I have put in the chat um, the, the link for feedback. If you have any feedback, um, please do fill in the questionnaires and we will email you the, the link for the, for the feedback. And I have also put in a link for Mosaic Group. Um, if you're interested to find out what's going on in this part world, do visit our website and get in touch from from uh, from there thank you very much and um, have a good evening and uh, good weekend when it comes bye <laughs>